generation to generation we worship you
somebody put your hands together because we have a great God that always gave us victory. Hallelujah. Through the trials, sickness, and circumstances, victory is mine. And I can rejoice today because victory is mine. Praise the name of all names the one who reigns forever still the same I will praise his name Hallelujah Jesus name above all names the one who reigns forever still the same praise the name Hallelujah No other name
name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, we praise your name, Jesus. Come on, somebody lift your hands and say, you are holy, Lord. You are holy, Lord. There is no like you, Lord. You are holy, Lord. You are holy. You are holy. We will offer you our praise in a mighty chorus. You are holy. Praise to the King of Kings. 
Clothed in rainbows of living colors, flashes of lightning, rolls of Oh, hallelujah. Somebody bless the Lord. Relationship with his name, 
We can come in with intimacy. We can come in with oneness in God, in Jesus. And we can ask anything you ask in his name. You shall receive it. You'll, he'll give it to you if it's healing, if it's depression, if it's deliverance, whatever it is. If it's a restoration in your marriage. There's nothing impossible for God. There's nothing impossible for God. Don't ever forget who he is. The power is in his name. The miracle working power, the supernatural virtue that comes out, it's from his name and having a relationship with him. Hallelujah. So we're going to pray today and we're going to ask for God whatever need we have. I know that there's a need for Sister Fullerton, Sister Knox's mother, and she is sick currently. Uh, and we're going to ask for prayer over her body, that God will do a miracle healing in her body. And if anybody else needs a miracle in their life, it, it could be healing, it could be restoration, it could be for a family member. You have a burden for someone, you have a burden for the White House. You can bring that need, that petition. You can pray unto God and you can say it in Jesus' name. And with your, according to your faith and your relationship with God, he's going to grant that petition. He's going to grant that need. So I'm going to ask you where you're at to raise your hand if you have a need. And if you feel like I don't have a need, I want you to pray for someone else. In Jesus' name. Lord God, I'm asking you right now. I come before you in reverence, in the fear of the Lord, recognizing that you're powerful, Lord, recognizing your majesty, Jesus, knowing that what you did for me, God, you took me out of drugs. You took me out of depressed heart and mind. You healed me. You healed my wife, God. You've healed my family members, God. I am thankful for what you've done, Lord. And now I'm asking another petition, Lord. I'm praying, Lord, for Sister Fuller, God, that you'll bring healing into her life. Touch her in the name of Jesus. Touch her in Jesus' name. Every, Lord, petition that comes, Lord, unto you. I'm praying, oh Lord, that you'll meet that need. I'm praying in Jesus' name, depression has to go. Satan, get thee behind me. You have no place for the church of Jesus Christ. The word says, Lord, you said, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. And it's a church with a revelation of your name. Jesus, in your name there is power. Jesus, in your name there is deliverance. And I'm praying it for the church today, God. Oh, in Jesus' name, I thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Holy One, all creation.
All I need is you, Lord. Is you, Lord. All I need is you. All I need is you. to the Lord this morning. Let your voice out unto him. And would you express that with your own words for a moment here this morning. Jesus, you are the only one, Lord, that can suffice, God. You are the only one that quenches our thirst, Lord God. Hallelujah, Jesus. There's no other place like your presence, Jesus. Come on, would you lift up your hands, lift your voices unto him for a moment. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. You may be seated this morning. We're going to ask the ushers to come at this time to prepare to receive the offering. Amen. I want to keep a few dates in front of you as we're uh, moving into the month of July. Amen. Amen. Also, 4th of July, amen, on Tuesday. Great time to be with your family. Amen. Barbecues and spending time connecting with our loved ones. Amen. So, Amen. Enjoy the 4th of July. Also on July the 9th, that is a Sunday, Sunday, July the 9th, Sunday morning, for all of our first, second, and third time guests, please come for our pastor's breakfast. Amen. Right here at Cross Creek, and you can see Pastor or Pastor Isaac for more information on that. Let everybody say amen. amen. Also, for all of our married couples, amen, we're going to be uh, focusing on our marriages and having God-centered marriages. So please come on out and join Pastor July the 9th at his house, amen, for a devotion and a small group on building stronger marriages, amen? amen. Praise God. Also, on Sunday, July the 16th, the third Sunday of the month, all of our young adults, all of our hyphen, we will be uh, gathering together for a special event. Amen. So you can see myself or my wife for more information. Amen. Let all of our hyphen say amen. amen. Woo. Praise God. 
Also, uh, we are going to be uh, in the month of August. Amen. I want everybody to focus on the month of August. So listen, if you could put up that uh, flyer for me. We will be having our prophecy conference. Amen. We had it last year, and my, 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 what a wonderful time of uh, instruction in the Word of God. And uh, I am excited for Pastor Nathaniel Haney. He will be coming back around again for our Prophecy Conference, August 11, 12, and 13. Amen. And you can pick up a postcard in the lobby on your way out. Amen. And we are encouraging all of you to attend in that. Amen. Also, please grab one and pass it out to a friend. This is a wonderful time, amen, for somebody to come and uh, to learn, amen, about what is going to unfold in our world next. Amen? amen. Praise God. See, the world is wondering what's going to happen next, but the Bible tells us what is to come. Amen? amen. Praise God. So please join us August 11, 12, and 13 for our prophecy conference. Amen. Let us stand this morning. We're going to pray over our tithe and our offering. And as the ushers come, let us give unto the Lord. Also, you might have noticed that the church looks a little bit different. All right, all right. Got some new paint on the walls. Amen. We are in the process this month of remodeling the church. For uh, many of you who don't realize, we have already been in this building for about 10 years now. Wow. The time has slipped past us. Praise God. And God has been good to us. It's about that time again. We got to freshen some things up. Amen. So we're going to remodel the front lobby, replace the floors. We're also going to get some new carpet. Uh, so installation will be in in the next couple of weeks. Amen. So please um, uh, support the church as we are endeavoring to remodel. Amen. If you feel it on your heart to give a little bit extra, uh, please mark it on the envelopes for uh, our building re uh, remodel. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Let us give unto the Lord. Father, we thank you this morning, Jesus, for you are faithful unto us. And we know, Lord God, that all things come from you, God. I thank you, Lord, for our jobs. I thank you, Lord, for your provision in our lives. And, Father, we give unto this offering this morning as a small token. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the amount that you allow us to keep, God. But, Father, we give out of a grateful heart this morning, Lord. And we give it unto you with gladness, Jesus. And we ask you to bless it and let us be used to reach the city around us for the cause of Jesus Christ. And let everybody say amen. 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 Worship the Lord as they sing. My God is more than enough. He can supply all my needs. He is my head, Shaddai. He always looks out for me. Jehovah Jireh. He is my God. Jehovah Jireh. He is my God. My God is more than enough. He will supply all my needs. He is my El Shaddai. He always looks out for me. Jehovah Jireh. 
you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. You're wonderful, Lord. I praise you. I exalt your name. I lift you up. You alone are worthy, Jesus, to be praised. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, my Jesus. Thank you, my God, my Savior. I glorify your name. I lift you up, Jesus. Hallelujah. You may take your seats, church. Today, I'm going to deliver the word of the Lord. If we can have the pianist uh, continue until we finish scriptures. Uh, it's a privilege to be up here. It's a privilege to preach the word of God. I, I don't take it lightly. We're dealing with eternity. Souls in eternity. And so I, I don't take it lightly. What I say in the pulpit, I, could, I see it. It's the word of God. And I'm just an instrument. I'm just an instrument to communicate what God wants for you in this time in your life. And I'm, I'm hoping that it will produce deliverance. It'll produce, it'll, it'll grow your faith and I'll allow you to be and aligned with the will of God and what God has for you in your life today. Amen. Hallelujah. So um, before we enter it, I uh, wanted to make an announcement. We're, we're doing outreach for the prophecy tour. Uh, I'm sorry, the prophecy conference we're having with uh, Pastor Haney in August. And so today we're going to go out at 3 p.m. and meet here at the church. And uh, my wife and I, whosoever uh, is available, will go out to stores and pass out the cards and uh, talk with people and let them know about Jesus, publish the gospel, invite them to the prophecy conference. It's it's going to be a powerful moment uh, where lives will be delivered as well. And uh, we, we have that uh, going every other Sunday. And uh, uh, Sister Vanessa is another team that's going out on certain Saturdays. And so if you uh, want to join us in this efforts, and I would love for you to join us. We need more people to serve. Then come talk with Sister Vanessa, talk with me. And uh, we'll, 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 we'll go out and we'll reach the lost. Amen. amen. Praise God. Give God a hand clap. And amen. If you can open your Bibles, we're going to go into the word of the Lord in Matthew 8, chapter 8, verse 16. Let us stand for the word, the reading of the word, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. Matthew chapter 8, verse 16 through 22. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask you to allow the word of God to, to prick your hearts, to receive it. Receive the word and let it transform your mind. Let it transform the way you think and perceive if you allow the word of God to minister to your life, it'll change you and it'll take you to places you, you'll be surprised you never thought God would, would take you there. He'll allow you to do things you never thought you'd be able to do, but with his grace, with his power. Amen. I feel burdened today. Matthew chapter 8, verse 16. And it says, when... The even was come, they brought unto him, to Jesus, many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out spirits with his word, with his word, and he healed all that were sick, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Him dying on the cross was a fulfillment of this. 
Now when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave commandment to depart unto the other side. And a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest, wherever you go. And Jesus saith unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said unto him, follow me. A little more intimate with the follow me. And let the dead bury the dead. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. We're going to read a little more scripture in Acts chapter 19 go to Acts chapter 19 and we're going to read a good portion we need the word of God in our hearts amen 19 1 through 20 Acts chapter 19 Acts is after the gospels chapter 19 verse 1 says and it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth Paul having passed through the upper coast came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, Verily, John barely baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is, on, G on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all men were about 12. And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when diverse uh, different people were, hearts were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyran Tyrannus. And this continued by the space of two years, so that all they which dwell in Asia, and it wasn't Asia today, it was a different portion uh, in the map of Asia. It wasn't uh, uh, the Asia we see today. It was, it was more around uh, Macedonia area. Heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the, the sick, handkerchiefs or aprons and the diseases departed from them and the evil spirits went out of them then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists people who try to cast out devils and demons took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus saying we adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul preacheth and there were seven sons of one Sceva a Jew and chief of the priests which did so and the evil spirit answered and said Jesus I know Paul I know but who are ye and the man in whom the evil spirit would leaped up leaped on them and the man whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded and here's a, an emphasis I want to put in, in these next four verses. And this was known to all the Jews and the Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus. We are in Ephesus. And fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and shewed their deeds. Many of them also which used curious arts brought their books together. That's witchcraft. And burned them before all men. 
And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver's worth. And five so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. That was revival, church. That was the church in the first century, in the right when the beginning of when it started, they were having revival. You may take your seats. And my sermon today is going to be titled that, When Revival Comes. Hallelujah. The Ephesians were having revival. And my title of it is, When Revival Comes, dot, dot, dot. Because something first has to happen before revival comes. There's changes that have to happen before revival comes. Hallelujah. And so I'm going to go back to that story where we read about Jesus. We see in this moment in the time of Jesus where before in the same chapter, Matthew 8, he had just healed a servant of a centurion who understood what it meant to be submitted under authority. And because of that, God honored and saw great faith of this man. And he healed him with his word. And then we see after that, Peter's, um, I believe it was Peter's wife's mother who was healed. And it was a healing through Jesus Christ. And then after that, we see that there's many people who are being brought to Jesus. They were being brought to this man who came, who is God on earth. And all the sickness were coming, all the people that were sick, they were laying them down to Jesus because they knew that he had power to heal all sickness and all diseases that came to him. Then we see the demon-possessed, real demon-possessed people who were bound by the devil. And I can imagine whatever happens, some people, some demon-possessed will do act like a fool and they'll try to intimidate They'll try to crawl on the ground and hiss and foam. And it's real. We have that today. But we know that when it got into contact with Jesus, whenever it got close to Jesus, it couldn't resist the power and the virtue that came out of him. And those demons had to flee. And they came out by his word. Hallelujah. I want to let you know there was power in the ministry of Jesus. Because he is God on earth, uh, the son of man, the son of God. God almighty manifest in the flesh uh, to show a powerful demonstration, to know who he is, to recognize who he is to all the people. (laughs) Hallelujah. And there was the next portion of the scripture. We see that there was a scribe. And our scribes, there were people who would, 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 uh, uh, they would interpret the law, and, but they would also write the law. And they were very prestigious in what they did. They were well known. And the scribe had saw all this, uh, all this of what was going on to Jesus. He would see the thronging and everybody touching to touch Jesus. And, and seeing the healing happen, the sickness uh, being, being healed. And, and people with that, with, with, uh, I know in Spanish, uh, people with, uh, who are paralysis were being raised up. Their legs were receiving sudden healing, and it was by the word and the power of Jesus. He was seen demon-possessed, and he, caught, he saw all that, and he thought, wow, how the crowds were thronging at him, how the crowds were with him. And he says, Jesus, I will follow you. I'll go wherever you, you go. But then Jesus answers something that's out of his world. It said, he said, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the son of man hath not where to lay his head. Now, what does this mean? This meant that, hey, the, the foxes have holes. They have a place to sleep. They get some comfortable sleep. The birds of the air have nests. They have a house. They have a place. But the son of man, he has no place to lay his head. When you come and follow me, Mr. Scribe, I'm going to lay my head on a rock. It's not going to be comfortable. And I can imagine this scribe, he got disappointed. And he, I can imagine him just seeing that the cost was too much. It wasn't like he was going to be nicely suited and go to the Ritz-Carlton Carlton, uh, Hotel and, 
and be able to, to be in all the limelight. He saw the glory of God. He saw the power of God, but he didn't see the sacrifice. He didn't see what Jesus had to go through to sleep on a rock. He says, when you follow me, it's going to require some sacrifice from you. It's going to require for you to go through things that are uncomfortable. It's going to require for you to come out of your comfortability. And I can imagine him just making his head fall down and turning away and walking away because the call was too great for him to bear. It was, a commitment. It was too much of a commitment to follow Jesus. Hallelujah. The scribe wanted to follow Jesus because of the limelight, the fame, and the popularity that surrounded Jesus, but found out that following Jesus was not so lucrative and took more sacrifice than what he expected. Hallelujah. And God wants you to, he wants to take you out of your comfortability. He wants to take you out of your security zone. And he wants you to be able to step out in faith so that you're able to serve him. Yes, when I go out, when we go out to outreach, I don't do it out of duty. I don't do it out of all oh, man. I, pastor says, and I have to do it with that kind of attitude. But when we serve, when we do it, we do it with an attitude of a servant attitude. We do it not out of duty, but because we love God, we do it because we understand we have a relationship with God because he changed my life and delivered me. And I'm going to get down personal today. We need to sacrifice our time. We need to sacrifice our resources. We need to sacrifice our finances if we ever want to get closer. If we want to follow, truly follow Jesus, we need to be able to lay some stuff down and truly step out of our comfort zone. Sacrifice. Even though I know there's lunch, there's a roast waiting in your in your house. Maybe, maybe I know there's plans to eat food. But what we need to do if we want to really follow Jesus uh, is to take this all out, all oh, whatever may be disturbing, whatever may be in your pocket, and I'm not talking about right now your money, but with the condition, the conditions that you want to serve God with, and we got to lay down some stuff and be able to sacrifice our time, our resources, our, and yes, our money to be able to reach the lost, to be able to do things in the kingdom of God. A lot of us see the limelight of the preaching. We see all the deliverance happening. We have praise reports of souls getting healed. We have all these powerful, miracles, special miracles that happen. But you will never get to there. You will never see that. You can't see that from the preacher. You only see that of the preacher. But you yourself cannot get there unless you lay stuff down. Unless you sacrifice and get out of your comfortability. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's elders. It's elders like Sister Kay Lane, who recently passed away, is the reason why we have saints that are in here mature. Because she spent her time, she spent her resources, she spent her finances, she, she sacrificed to see all this. It's, it's women. And pillars like that lady, like that lady, that sister in Christ. Why we have all these walls? Why we have this building right here? I wasn't there when you started the church, when you were at the church in, in, in Laurel. But we see this now and we see it because there was people like her who decided that I'm going to stay. I'm going to do whatever I need to do. And it's up to you who are well and alive today. It's up to the gen young generation as us as well. That will take up that torch like that baton that's in a race. When that when someone's going off in a race and they there's a runner that's waiting to get that baton when it's going around the circle. They're running that race. They're running that race. And they're wanting to win that race. And when they get that baton, they hand it, hand it down. And here we are. We're waiting for that baton. And as soon as that runner comes, they grab that. And they grab the baton and go. They run, they run, they run. 
and they run that race and it's the same race as our elders, the same race as Sister Keelane. There's somebody here that God is calling that's going to take up that baton, that's going to take up that sacrifice, that's going to take their time, their resources, their money in order to please God, in order to truly follow God. Hallelujah. And I'm going to be one of them. I'm going to be the first to say, I will sacrifice my time. I will sacrifice my resources. I will sacrifice everything. Whatever God wants me to do, I'll deny myself. I'll take up my own cross and I'll follow Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You have to remember it's not to man. We're not doing it to please man, to please flesh. We're not doing it to make ourselves look good. Look what I did. We're not doing it to say, look the works that I'm doing. You don't earn your salvation through works. Uh, but it's because of a loving relationship we have with God is why we do what we do. Uh, it's because of what he did for me. Uh, I want to tell you one thing. Uh, if we would never have a Sister Kay Lane if there wasn't a Pastor Overton that was here who spent time with her. We would not have a sister Vanessa, if there wasn't a sister Kay Lane that would spend time and pouring out unto her and making her the woman of God that she is, a, a boldness to go speak out. I was with, with sister Vanessa one day. This is not to glory anybody, but she, we were just driving on our cars, and I've never seen this before, but she just stopped the car, was being behind her in another car, and she says, hey, you, hey, you out there in the street in the sidewalk, have you heard about Jesus? And she talked about Jesus and gave him an invitation. He stopped and walked right up to her car and says, okay, okay. And he took that invitation and walked, and that just changed his world. I say this because we would not have people here. You would not be here if it weren't for people like Sister Kayleen. You will not be here if it weren't for someone else who spent time with you to give you Bible study, to tell you about God, to pray for you in those closed doors. There's people who might not be up in this pulpit, who might not preach at a big conference and gather, but we will never know their name. We'll never know who they are, but they will be people who are great in the kingdom of God because they were people who were behind the scenes doing work for God, sacrificing their time, their resources, and their money. Hallelujah. I would not be here if it weren't for souls who had spent time in my life, who had prayed for me. And likewise, we need you to spend time with other souls, to disciple them. We, we are so happy. We want them to get the Holy Ghost the way the apostles receive it. We want them to come into the new birth so that they can enter the kingdom of God. But that's when they are just a babe in Christ. That's when they are just birthed and we need to disciple them. We need to, to, to be on their side and say, brother, sister, I'm going to pray for you. What is your need? Are you struggling? Let us pray together. We need someone to be with us and we need to show them this is how we outreach. This is how we do it. I want to show you. Come, let me disciple you. Let me show you how we do it hallelujah hallelujah thank you Jesus we have ministries in the church we have altar workers we have greeters we have outreach ministry we have van ministry we need drivers we have follow-up ministry we have home groups you can get involved in any faucet of the ministry if there's anything that you can do you want to say pastor I want to do something there's all these ministries that we can be plugged in and do for God hallelujah thank you Jesus and we looked at the next portion the next person First it was a scribe, and then it was a disciple. And the disciple also said, I'm willing to go, but let me first bury my father, is what he said. And it may seem a little mean what Jesus replied. He said, let the dead bury the dead. Yeah. Hallelujah. Let's give God a hand clap. I'm going to drink some water. said let the dead bury the dead and we might think oh man what, 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 
what is Jesus saying? You know, this is me. His dad has died, and, and he, he's not going to let me bury his dad. But in reality, that's not the way the Eastern culture did things. If we look into the Eastern mindset and the, and the Eastern cultures, uh, they did not embalm their dead because they had to have buried them within 24 hours to prevent sickness and disease from spreading. And so what they did is they, they already buried him within 24 hours. That meant the father was already buried. But what this meant is that this son who wanted to, he said, let me bury my father. What he was meaning is that he wanted, he was a son that was chosen by his father to make the burial arrangements and to take over his father's business. And while doing this, he would inherit everything that would be from his father. And so think about this. If you, you're a father and you have a lot of businesses and, and you have wealth, you, you would have a secure security if you were to go and do those burial arrangements, if you were to be the one to take over the businesses. He says, I'll follow you, Jesus. And now notice this is not a scribe. This is a disciple of Jesus. And he, and he just wanted to follow Jesus with conditions. Uh, first off, I want this security. Get, let me have this security first. I know I'll have money. I'll be secure. You know, th this, is, this is comfortability, my comfort zone. I'll, I'll, I'll be able to follow you with this security. I want to follow you, God, but let, let me take this first and, and then I'll follow you. I used to think that way when I went to Bible college. I would want to uh, get a, a EMT certification. I passed it. It was hard and rigorous to go through the national registry test. And it was, it was to be a paramedic firefighter. And I thought, well, I'm, you know what? I'm going to study first. I'm, I'm going to get this. And then when I get the job, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a job when I go to Bible college. But God was calling me for something more. He was keep calling me to go to Bible college. I went and experienced the power of God. And I said, you know what? I'm just going to let it all go. I let go of a $16 an hour job, and I was able to go to a $20 an hour job and just keep it going $1 every year after that. I said, I'm going to let it all go because what's more important is what if God can do what he did for me. He took bitterness out of my life. He took, he took hatred out of my life. He showed me what forgiveness was. He, he took alcohol and drugs and all that stuff that was from the devil. He took it and delivered it out from me. If he can do what he did for me, how much more if he can do it for someone else? How much more? It's not money can't buy what's eternal. Money can't buy what's in the kingdom, in the economy of God. And so I said, yo, I'm just going to, it doesn't matter about the finances. Then going to the Bible college, you have comfort, I had confrontation. I had others who were looking at me and thinking I'm crazy. What are you going to do with a bachelor's degree? What are you going to do with that Bible college degree? What are you going to do? Well, how much money are you going to make when you get out? I said, you know what? It's not about the money. And I'll let them know my testimony. I'll let them know that God delivered me. He saved me. And money can't buy that. Money can't buy what, how much you sow, how much you put into this word and you allow it to change you and transform you. Money can't buy that. Seeing a soul that's right here, seeing little Christian receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Money can't buy another soul getting the spirit of God inside of them. A soul getting baptized in Jesus' name, making a covenant with God. Money can't buy that. Money can't buy so many people, so many wealthy people will pay psychologists thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars just to get counseling, just to get some kind of medication to heal, heal their depression and try to heal their wounds that they have from people that have offended them in their past. And they're trying, to looking for help. But it was only by the power of Jesus that when they came in contact with Jesus, it was him that delivered them from that. There's money that can't buy the power. Money can't buy the glory of God. And if you want to see the power and the glory of God, you got to lay some stuff down and serve him unconditionally. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Give a hand clap to Jesus. Praise God. can't be fake in our Christianity. We can't. 
It's, it, we're talking about eternity here. It, we, there's too much to lose. There's too much to lose. And so we can't be jumping up and down and, and praising God here and not serving him while we're at, not serving him when we're at work. When you say, I'm going to follow Jesus, when the rubber meets the road, there's going to be a test that's going to come. Just like Jesus' words, there's going to be a test of your commitment to him. There's going to be a co-worker who is full of the devil, and he's going to come and test your patience. And he's going to speak against you. And he's going to say, Isaac, what's up, man? I said, wow, what's the problem? I said, I'd rather be in church than do overtime. What? What? Forget this. And he would cuss at you and say bad words. And he's going to, he's going to, and I'm going to say, and I, I, I told my coworker, if you had what I had, you would go to church too. He said, man, I don't want none of that. He would cuss and, and, and curse and talk all, all about the church. And what are you going to do when someone wants to punch you in your face and threaten you in front of your boss and your manager? What are you going to do? When the devil comes in your face and he challenges you for who you are and what you stand for. What are you going to do when you're at work and you have to live a life of integrity. And you can't do more time or less time. Or you, you can't take a little money here, a little money there. No, when you got to live with a life of integrity with your heart and God sees what you do. What are you going to do when nobody is watching you and your job? When there's a patient that's right there, are you going to leave that patient who's helpless and can't do nothing? Or are you going to go there and have, have love with that person even though they are not right in their heart? Even though they are angry and they cuss at you? What will you do? How will you react? What will you do? When the test comes, when the rubber meets the road, there's going to be a test for every Christian, every follower of Christ. You can get away if you're really kind of just, kind of just, uh, I come to church every Sunday and you can kind of, not really fully committed, you can get away with a lot of things. You can, but when you really have a heart after Jesus, there will be a test for every one of you. It's easy to live that life of temporary pleasures you get in the bottle that you get in trucks. It's easy. It's easy to scream back and fight back and punch back and do whatever you're going to do and, and let your flesh take over and live by the carnal ways of the flesh. This Wednesday, Sister Maria said, but I crucify this flesh. There's a scripture that says, I crucify this flesh. And we're doing it so that we can walk in the spirit, so we can bear fruit in the spirit. We can bear the fruit of love, the joy, the peace, all oh, the fruit of patience, of goodness, of gentleness, of faith, of meekness, of self-control. And allow God to work that inside of us so that when the fences come, so that when people come and they scream at your face, when they falsely accuse you and point fingers at you, you will come back with love. You'll come back with the glory of God. You'll come back with a smile and you'll pass the test that God has for you. You'll stay committed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to let you know, there are Christians out there, they'll say, I'm Christian, yeah, I, I've been baptized, yeah, we're Pentecostal as well. Really, they're not, they're not real, the real deal. They're not what the scripture actually says. They don't line up for the word, and they'll, they'll talk about, uh, they'll, they'll compromise, and they'll laugh at the jokes of the other coworkers. They'll laugh at the perversion of this world, but you got to say, oh, you know what, I'm not going to laugh at that. I'm going to put up my flag, and there's a line that's drawn. Isn't that what Bishop Wright had said in Gather? There's going to be a line that's going to be drawn of who really is a Christian and who really is not. And I want to let you know for the ones who are truly committed to God in this very, very dark world, in this ugly, nasty world as it is today. It's out and it's just, it's just out and plain and just like that. The light who you have inside of you is going to shine just lighter and brighter in that darkness let the world be darker as it's going to be as the time comes where we're going to be raptured let the darkness come let all the threats come let the devil come to your face but the light that's inside of you will shine even brighter and everyone will know that you are a christian that you are a follower of jesus christ
Jesus said in Matthew 16, 24. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. That means God has a cross. Jesus has a cross for every one of you. I can't make that decision for you. Your fathers can't make that decision for you. Pastor can't make that decision for you. You have to take up your own cross. It's personal, you see. Coming from California, we have a very Catholic back uh, group of people who live there. Mo a lot of them are Mexicans. Over here, it's every, every type of Hispanics. Over there, the majority in California is Mexicans. 99% of them, I'm exaggerating, but a lot of them <laughs> are Catholic. Right. And it's a, it's a, they come through a tradition. And they'll say, well, I go to church, so I'm Catholic. Or my parents, because they go to church, I'm Catholic. And they identify with that. But you can't have it just because someone else has it. Even if you're, you're, you're the parent, your own child has to have his own experience with Jesus. He's got to pick up his own cross. There's going to be a point where you've you got to teach them, but as they grow up and they grow up to their youth, they're going to have to have their own new birth experience and pick up their own cross. It needs to be personal with you and Jesus. He said, pick up your cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life will lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. And so we go about the bit doing our own business and living our life our own way we want to. You're going to lose your life. But if we say, not my will, not my desires, God, not my dreams, not my plans. You see, the disciple who wanted to first bear, to go through the burial arrangements, he had his life all planned out already. He had it all mapped out. And, excuse me, I might have some stuff on my face. Just ignore it. And uh, he had his life planned out. And sometimes we, we think we have it all planned out. But when you truly say, not my will, Lord, but yours be done, God is going to change things up in your, your he's going to rock your world and change it all around. But at the end of it, it's not going to be easy. It's not. You're going to go through trials. You're going to go through tribulations. You're going to go through some suffering. But what you're suffering is just temporary in this earth. God has a greater reward for you in heaven. Amen. Hallelujah. And it's to glorify his name. It's so that his name is magnified. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So what do we do? What happens when we choose to follow Jesus in our lives? When we are pointed to Jesus, we're pointed to the cross. And we want to carry it. We say, God, not my will, but yours be done. I'm choosing to let everything go. I surrender it all. Pastor, tell me what I need to do to be saved. What do I need to do to live for God? What do I need to do to enter into the kingdom of God? We hear it again and again, and it's okay because it's still recent. It's still new. It's still fresh. It doesn't lose its old fashion. It always stays the same. It's the Acts 2.38. The first thing we do is we repent. That means a change of direction, not just saying, God, forgive me of my sins and continue the same dirt that you do. But what you do is you say, God, forgive me of my sins. I'm literally changing direction. I'm turning around and I'm following you. I'm giving it all up. All this alcohol, all this lifestyle of gambling and sin, all these bad words. It's not you say a bad word and say, oops. No, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And if your heart truly is given to the Lord, you're going to let go of all those things and follow Jesus. First, it's repentance. Second, 
because you believe in God and you say, you know what, I chose to give my life to God. I ask God to forgive me of all my sins. You make now a blood covenant with God. Just as Abraham had a blood covenant when he had to be circumcised, he was in covenant. He had a binding contract with God. Likewise, in the New Testament, when we get baptized in that water that's right here in the name of Jesus Christ, uh, not in titles, but it, it, in the name of God, in the name of Jesus, uh, then we have a binding contract. We have a, a, a we have a covenant that we are made with God, and God brands his name on your life. Uh, yes, amen, and you're born in the water. Hallelujah. I didn't know this, but when you brand farmers, when they're out and they're farming, they, back in the days, and I they probably still do it today, but they, they would brand a horse. And they would get a steel and they would name it after their own name or whatever their company name. And they'll put it in the fire and make it real hot, that hot iron. And they would still let it burn inside so that there would be a mark on that horse. And they'll know, this is my property. I own this. This is not its own, and so whatever, if it ever gets lost, I, I will know that that's my property. That's my horse. That belongs to me, to the farmer. And so likewise, when we get baptized in the precious name of Jesus, the name that is all-powerful, the name that's uh, under heaven, given among men, whereby we must be saved. It's the same name where we every knee shall bow and tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. It's that same name that cast out devils. It's the name of that person that was delivering all the sicknesses and, and all the spirits that were inside different people. When we get baptized in Jesus' name, we are branded with the name of Jesus. We're no longer our own, but we're sold to God. And He, we belong to him. We're not our own. So our decisions are no longer our ownership, but it's the decision of Christ. When we say, not my will, but yours be done, it's because it's of the will of God. It's because it is of the mind and the heart of God. When we say this, we are branded in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. The third thing we do is we ask God, God, fill me with your spirit. And when God fills you with his spirit, the way the apostles did in the book of Acts and in the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, and also in Acts chapter, uh, what I can remember, 10 and 11 and 19 and many more, that they would begin to speak in another language, in, another, in other tongues. And it was in a beautiful experience that they had when they received the spirit of God. It was a new covenant, a new birth that was in through the spirit. And when when you seek the, the kingdom of God, when you seek Jesus, when you begin to worship him with all your heart, you'll begin to receive and feel the spirit of God run over you, and you'll begin to speak in another tongue the way they did it 2,000 years ago, and today there are souls receiving that same experience. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. This is why. We saw Paul in Acts chapter 19 say, come and ask, what, have you been uh, bap since, uh, have you been filled with the Holy Ghost since you believed? Have you received the Spirit? They said, we never knew there was any Holy Ghost. Oh, really? Well, then, so what baptism were you baptized with? With John. And way back earlier, John was baptizing a baptism of repentance, and it was to lead them to Jesus Christ, the one who saves. He was preparing the way for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when, when he did this, he, they got baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, and he laid hands over them. And as he laid hands over them, they began to speak in tongues and prophesy. That was a fulfillment of Joel 2.28. And so this is what God wants for you if you have not yet received that experience. Then, revival came. You see, when we receive the Holy Spirit of God, when we make a covenant with him in those waters, then God gives us the same ministry of Jesus Christ when he was healing the sick and casting out devils. 
And so now he gives us that same ministry. And God uses us as an instrument to lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. To cast out devils in the name of Jesus. He gives us that ministry to go minister to souls. So if you have that, then revival comes. Then revival comes. When revival comes, it's when souls are getting the Holy Ghost and they are doing what the scripture says and living in the ministry of Jesus. Hallelujah. They're publishing the gospel to every soul, spending time to lost souls that are out there, to pour into them, to let them grow and mature and see the power of God through humility. Hallelujah. We see then uh, another thing happens is their special miracles were done by the Apostle Paul, and God did it by him. And he would get aprons. And through the aprons, there was people that would be healed. There was people through the, that would be healed and devils that were cast out and people who had deliverance happen through them. Then we see others, exorcists. And they see the limelight of that, whoa. This guy, Paul, he's, he's out of this world. He, uh, I mean, he is just, people are getting sick, and they're just seeing him. But they noticed he's using the name of Jesus. He's using the name of Jesus. And uh, it has to be in this, in this, something about this name. Well, if he could do it, we can do it too, right? So these exorcists, not knowing, not having a relationship with God, not having a relationship with the name of Jesus, they say, I adjure you. By the same name that Paul uses, the, the name of Jesus, to come out. The, the, the devils, the spirits inside of that person that hasn't possessed said, Jesus I know. Paul I know. Man, I bet they tremble with, with them. They don't want to be near them. But who are you? I don't know you. You don't have a relationship with God. You don't pray. You don't seek God in prayer. You don't read the word of God, have a relationship with this word. Do you, do you have the same spirit of, of Jesus, that same spirit dwelling inside of you? Do you, do you have, the, I, I, don't, I don't know you. And so God, and so what happened is the same, that person who was bound with the same spirits prevailed against those exorcists, people who cast, so, so, uh, supposedly cast out devils. And he left them naked and chased them and left them to shame. If you don't have a relationship with the word of God, if you don't have a relationship with the name of Jesus, the devil's going to come and leave you to shame. He will leave you to shame. He will. So what I'm saying, church, is when we follow Jesus, we are truly need to be committed to God, committed to prayer, committed to reading the word, committed to spending time with Jesus and having a relationship with his name. I can't mention his name unless I have a relationship with him. I can't cast out any devil, any demon unless I have a prayer walk life with God. I can't do any of that. I can't be praying for souls and laying hands on over the sick. I can't be with this microphone. Shame on me if I did not have a walk with God. And I'd be preaching the word of God and I'd be praying for souls to be healed. I'll be praying for souls to be delivered. And I did not have a walk with God on this microphone. We need to have a walk with God. We need to have a relationship with his name. We need to pray and seek God. And then the power of God will come. And then revival comes. And then you see souls delivered. And then demons will be cast out. And then, yes, uh, the sick will be healed. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. Uh, give a hand clap to the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We need to not only be baptized in the precious name of Jesus, covered by his blood, filled with the Holy Ghost, with a Bible sign of speaking in tongues. Uh, we need to have a relationship and a walk with him. The next, next thing we see when revival came is one, the fear of the Lord came on them all when they saw this. And when they had a fear of the Lord, I'm not talking about being scared and afraid, but I'm talking about having a reverence and a respect of the things of God, a respect and a reverence of his name and not taking his name in vain. 
not being playful with his name, not just tossing it out like that. It's a powerful name. We need to revere it. Amen. The fear of the Lord came. That means having, having a reverence in the things of God, even in the house of God. Not bringing coffee and not bringing food, but knowing that this is a sacred place. This pulpit is a holy place. I don't take it lightly. When you come into the altar call, it's a holy place. It's a sacred place. It's a place for you to pray. We can't have food or, or, or have gum in our mouths while we're here in the altar call. We need to revere this place and revere the house of God and respect it and teach our children that this is no ordinary place. But this is where lives are delivered, where souls are delivered and people who are sick are healed and demon possessed coming out this is no ordinary place hallelujah two when that happened the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified and this is something powerful is that when we magnify the name of Jesus together as a body, when we come together in praise, when we come together and give him the glory and not flesh, then the name of Jesus is glorified. Then the name of Jesus is magnified. Then revival comes. When revival comes, the name of Jesus is magnified. That's why when we see these songs that are talking about Jesus, this is why we give God praise. We see God with all of our hearts. We lift up a hand and we shout. This is why we cry and we tear because we have relationship with the name of Jesus and his name is magnified. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. Three, many that believed came and confessed and shooed their deeds this means there was a conviction that settled in their hearts when the word of God comes when the gospel is published to people when people are seeing the power of God when revival comes there's a group of people who allow the word of God to minister to them convict them of their wrongdoings and bring them to repentance and say Lord forgive me of my sins Forgive me because I, I didn't have an, I didn't act the way I was supposed to at work. I had the wrong attitude towards pastor. Forgive me, Lord. I, I feel convicted. I could have I could have gone outreaching at this time when really I just, you know, I, I, I went and, and just did nothing in my home and, and played video games all day. <laughs> whatever it is. You did whatever you did and you knew you could could have given it to God. You knew there was a calling, but you chose not to respond to it. You knew God was saying you needed to let this go. There needs to be a conviction that settles in our hearts. And we say, God, I'm, I'm going to shoo my deeds. I'm going to let this go. For some of us, I'll get there. The, third, the fourth thing is, many of them with curious arts. And uh, this pertains to witchcraft brought their books together and burned them before all men. And it was, it was no little thing. It was worth 50,000 pieces of silver's worth. That was a lot. I, I couldn't calculate how much that was back in the days. It would be a good research tool to know how much that was compared to today. But that meant that they sacrificed. That meant they let go of things. And there's, there, there's things in our lives that, it might not necessarily uh, seem like it's sin, but it's what distracts us and it keeps us from has st standing between you and God and truly having a relationship with God. I'm talking about TV here. I'm talking about the shows that you're not supposed to be watching. I'm talking about video games your children are not supposed to be playing. I'm talking about things that, you, that will distract you from truly spending your time, your resources, and your finances with God. You know, watching these movies, there are a lot of movies that are satanic. And spirits can come and minister to you through that. They'll come out of those movies. They call scary movies, right? They're demon-possessed and they're full of satanic things that happen. Some of them really have spells inside. There's, there's movies that aren't so innocent nowadays. You go and see Disney movies, they have witches inside. And we allow our children to see these things and grow up on these things. We are allow our children to be ministered by the devil's works. This is also a form of witchcraft. 
This is also a form of way that the devil, the spirits come and minister. The Bible says the eyes are a window to our soul. And we allow ourselves to see things, to hear music that it does not glorify God. And it glorifies the devil or it glorifies flesh. Then we allow ourselves to be deceived by the devil. And there are things that keep us from truly connecting and having a relationship with God. Lord, why can't I feel you? Why can't I this happen? Why can't I experience the supernatural? Why can't I? But it's because you have junk that's inside of your heart that you allow the window, a door to open of spirits to minister to you. And you got to let all that out, shoo your deed, and leave that be out of, out of your life and allow the spirit of God to minister to you. We need to put a preaching on while we're driving in our car. We need to put a preaching on, if you can, with our headphones at work. We need to, we need to sing songs, sing hymns as we're walking by. Don't waste that time. Don't, don't allow your time to be wasted in things that are fruitless, that will allow you to produce and mature and grow. And it is why we believe things, and a lot of times we think we know a bunch of stuff, but really we got it from Hollywood. We got it from the movies. And really, they're not, it's not the truth. It'll say it's facts, but it's not truth. It's the truth that'll set you free. And when we get the word of God, when we get the gospel of Jesus in our hearts, that's what's going to set us free and deliver us. Hallelujah. We want to see our children grow and prosper. We want to see the youth grow and prosper. We want to see them get the Holy Ghost. We need to start with ourselves first and then set the example for our children. As head of the home, we got to say, no, child, you're not, I'm not going to give this to you because I want to have, be right in the eyes of God. I want to have a pure heart. The scripture says, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Not someone who has junk and tainted with all kinds of stuff inside their heart, but if they're able to make themselves right, with God, you align and you position yourself with God, with the will of God, and you allow him to operate and flow through your life, and he will be a flow when you're outreaching, when you're speaking about God, you'll see tears that start to come to those souls, you people will start to tell you stuff you, did, you didn't even, you weren't even looking, but they came and they start telling you all their junk and all their stuff, and you say, this is ministry time. This is God, is, there's an opportunity here for me to speak the word of God and let him know about Jesus Christ. But it's because you were already consecrated. You were already in a relationship with his name, with his word. You are already letting yourself, letting all, cutting off all this sin, trimming it all off so that you can have a pure heart and be able to minister with a pure heart. Allow God to minister to you. And I'm going to say this with proposal. Sometimes we need to have an old-fashioned. There's times in our lives we need to have an old-fashioned bonfire where we go outside and join together as a, as a, as a church in one mind. And you grab the, the CD discs and you grab all the movies and all the junk and all the stuff and you say, you know what? This has kept me from having a relationship with God. I'm going to bring it to that bonfire. I'm going to burn it today. I'm not going to sell it to another another person so that they can get that same that they can also have that same junk in their hearts and no that's the cost that's the price i'm gonna lay this down i'm gonna throw it to the trash i'm gonna this keeps me distracted from things of god i'm gonna throw away these books i'm gonna throw away that thing right there that's distracting me and i'm gonna give all my life to god and now what what powerful thing we would have what a revival we would have if we would take all our stuff that would keep us from god all the stuff that was idolatry and we would bring it all together and we'll light that thing and match it up and see it burn so they will never come back into our lives again. Hallelujah. That's when revival comes, friend. That's when we see the supernatural. That's when we see the sick heal. That's when we see demon possessed come out. That's when we see a revival in the body of the church. That's when revival comes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We need to remember, like in the book of Revelations, one of the churches was Ephesus, and this was happening in Ephesus. It's to remember, you know, you do, you, you do works, you do fine, but he said, you forgot one thing. You forgot your first love. 
And so these objects of idolatry, these objects that stand between us, uh, it, it allows us to give the affection more to that object, that materialistic thing. And I'm not saying it's everything. I'm just saying you know what's in your heart. I'm not limiting it to TV. You know, I'm not saying you're going to hell if you have one in your house. I, I personally made the decision to get rid of it. There's nothing good. They, and, and, uh, and it's up to for pastor to let you know, okay, and everybody has their own ways, personal convictions, pastoral convictions, amen, and, and uh, scriptural, biblical convictions. It is not biblical. It doesn't say TV in the Bible. But I'm, you know what distracts you. You know what distracts in your heart. And so you got to say, this is what I'm going to leave behind. That what you give your affection to is considered idolatry. And when we do that, we forget about our first love. And God wants us to remember him as our first love. Put him first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And... All these things shall be added to you. Food to eat on your table. Clothes to wear. All these things. He'll supply your need. You need rent for your, for your, uh, for your place. You need to pay the mortgage and your house. It seems like it's impossible. When we say nothing is impossible for God, we, we can't come with a, with a heart that's with idolatry. But we got to come with that pure heart saying, God, nothing's impossible for you. I've done my part, and I know you will supply my need because your word is a promise. And I put my faith in that promise, and I believe it with all of my heart. That all these things shall be added unto me if I put you first. So we need to put God first, church. We need to put him first and get rid of all that junk. Hallelujah. If I were to say the fourth thing, the fourth last, fifth last thing, excuse me, it says, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. There's that word prevailed again. When at one point, exorcists did not have a relationship with the name of Jesus. They did not have a relationship with the word of God. It was the evil spirits that prevailed over them and left them to shame. But on the other hand... If we decide to get the junk that's out of our hearts, that affection of idolatry out of our minds, then the word of God will prevail. And the word will prevail mightily into our lives. Hallelujah. The word of God is what will bring life and life in abundance. It is Jesus. It is spirit. It is life. It will produce life. It will produce some 30-fold, some 60, some 100-fold. It will fall on good soil. It will produce fruit. Hallelujah. That's when revival comes. When revival comes, I'd like you to stand. When revival comes. You're willing to make the sacrifice of living for God despite the hardship. When revival comes, you're willing to make the commitment of trusting in God with all your heart, with all your finances, with all your resources, with all your time, with all your energy. When revival comes, you have a love for truth and a love for sound doctrine, a genuine prayer relationship with God. When revival comes, you choose to take idolatry out of your lifestyle because you know it's what consumes your time from spending it in the kingdom of God. When revival comes, we have a fear of the Lord that comes upon us. It's a revival of God's fear, God's reverence over our lives, a reverence for the house of God, a reverence for his name, and a church that comes together to magnify his name. When revival comes... God is given all the glory and not flesh. When revival comes, special miracles, signs, wonders, healings begin to happen and devils begin to be cast out and people begin to be delivered. Church, let revival come. Let revival come. And it's up to you to choose for it to come.
Will you allow revival to come? Will you allow and stand up for yourself to stand for truth? Or will you be like the scribe who wanted to, he saw all the luxurious things, but he didn't want to pay the price of commitment. Are you willing for revival to come? Or will you be like that disciple who wanted a, a security, a sense of security and then follow Jesus and not depend on him to be his full provider and security? We are remodeling the church today throughout this week. We need funds. We need finances. I didn't preach this just to dedicate it to finances. I have preached it so that it would minister to your heart. Because we don't give grudgingly. We don't give out of duty. We give because we love God and we have a relationship with Him. And we need finances. Will you trust in God with your finances? Will you give a little bit and, and let it squeeze and tighten up your belt a little bit? Maybe have a little bit of food to eat. But I want to let you know that if your belt is being tightened up and we only have a little bit to eat, God is still going to provide for you every single day because he has for me. I want to let you know, church, I'm going to make an altar call today. I want to let you know that God he loves you. Jesus loves you. And he wants you to do this. He wants you to let go any object of affection that stands between you and him. He wants to have intimacy with you. But you have to allow him. So if you feel that call of God, if you hear his voice saying, follow me. Church, will you make a declaration in heaven? Will you come to the altar today and say, God, I'm committing myself. I'm not looking for the shouting. I'm not looking for the, uh, the, the dancing right now. I believe what God is looking for today is your commitment. He's looking for your heart today. So if you feel that call, come and respond to the call of God right now. Come to the altar and let's make a declaration. Let's make a commitment. Lord, I surrender my heart. I surrender everything to you, God. Unconditionally, without conditions, God. I surrender my life to you. Oh, with all my finances, God, with all my time and money, I give you my life.
worship you. I want someone to pair up with someone else if it's appropriate. Women with women, men with men. And if you have a family member, I want you to pair up with that family member. Husbands and wives, children. And uh, there will be a spirit of unity today. We will pray together and commit together. If you are in your family, I want you to pray commitment that your family will do all that it can to live for God unconditionally. If you're with a brother and sister, likewise. And let us pray together and commit together. Lord Jesus, we're committing right now, God, as the family of God, as husband and wife, as children, as youth, Lord, as brothers and sisters, my new mothers, my new fathers in Christ. We're committing together in unity to let go, to commit in prayer, to support one another, to encourage one another, to not falsely accuse, but to love one another, to lift up my brother in the name of Jesus, lift up my sister in prayer. In Jesus' name, I pray unity in the body. I pray unity in the body. In Jesus' name, one love, one church, one bride together in heaven. In the name of Jesus. Chains are gone. I've been sent free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy brings an ending of a place. Thank you. 
thankful for the blood of Jesus this morning. Hallelujah. Amen. Let us lift our hands and thank the Lord one more time. Thank you, Jesus, Lord. Hallelujah for the word of the Lord that we heard here today, Jesus. Hallelujah. I pray, Lord, let this word find a lodging place in all of our hearts here today, God. In the name of Jesus, and let everybody say amen. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed this morning.